I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Sometimes I think New Testament believers, uh, looking at the Old Testament, looking at the Bible, uh, kind of forget or, or miss what prophecy is all about. Prophecy is not about foretelling the future, although prophets did, of course, foretell the future. Prophets did pass along promises from God as to what would happen. But the real job of prophets and the real job of prophecy is to proclaim the truths of God. That's why we are prophets, because we tell people the truths that are contained in Holy Scripture. The greatest prophet, of course, is Christ. And Christ and his gospel are what we need to prophesy. We think on that as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please open your worship folders to page 5, the Advent candle lighting at the top of the page. Advent is a time to prepare. During Advent, we prepare to share the joy of Christ with others and to embrace the peace of Christ in his gospel promises. On this third Sunday of Advent, we hear and obey the calling of St. John the Baptizer and prepare ourselves in soul, mind, and body to welcome our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came, still comes, and will come again. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make the way for our God. 
Let us celebrate the glory of Christ's first coming on Christmas by reflecting his glory in our daily lives of repentance and faith. Greetings to all of you this morning. Good to have you all here. Uh, we, uh, we shall follow the order of service as is printed out for us in our worship folders uh, once again this morning. And uh, we open with the first hymn listed there, verses 1 through 5. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, 
I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we rejoice in you always. We rejoice in you again and again, for your gentleness is evident to all. We know you are near. Therefore, do not allow us to be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, allow us to present our requests to you. Praise the Lord! Having obtained pardon for all of our sins, and thus peace with God, we now come before him in prayer and praise. O oh, Lord God, the Father in heaven, you abound in grace and love. As the maker of all things, continue to preserve them for our use. O oh, Christ our King, you bring salvation for all. As God's own Son and our mediator at the heavenly throne, hear us and grant our supplications. O oh, God, Holy Ghost, you create and guard our faith, a gift we need the most. Bless our life's last hour that we leave this sinful world with gladness and peace. Please be seated. Let us give glory to God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, dear Lord Jesus. Come with the good news of deliverance. Drive out the darkness from our hearts and fill them with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Our Old Testament reading for this morning is the very familiar and comforting words from Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling. 
Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, call out. And then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade. But the, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing youths. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm portion comes from Psalm 85. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Truth springs from the earth. Indeed, the Lord will give what is good. Righteousness will go before him. Our epistle is given to us by St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthian congregation, chapter 4. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, and yet I do not by this acquit it. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. This too is the word of the Lord. You who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth, awaken your might, and come. Awaken your might, come and save us, hallelujah. We rise for the gospel reading. Our gospel today comes from the writer Matthew, chapter 11, beginning at the second verse. Now when John, that is John the baptizer, while imprisoned, heard the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of woman, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. And yet... The one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Here ends the gospel. (music) 
we confess our Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day. Grace, peace, mercy, and truth be multiplied unto you through Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Amen. God's word upon which we base our meditation briefly this morning is given to us in the gospel reading 
looking especially at these verses. And Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? The reed shaken by the wind. But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see, prophet? Yes, and I tell you one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it's written, Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way up before you. And I say to you, those born of women, there are not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. And yet one who is in least of the kingdom is greater than he. O Lord, sanctify us with your truth. Your word alone is truth. Amen. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, You know already that the word Advent means coming, as in the coming of Christ. The first coming, to celebrate that, coming as a baby in Bethlehem, and the second coming, when he comes in the clouds of glory on the last day. And so there's a certain amount of expectation built in to this season. Expectation of Christmas, of course. Christmas is really all about expectations, isn't it? Even when we were little, we expected certain things. We expected to experience certain things. What we expected to see, what we expected to hear, what we expected to do, and of course, what we expected to get. Now, in later years, we expect to make wonderful memories. We expect to add to those memories that we already have for this time of year. But how often do our expectations match with the experiences that we have? I would say not always. I think that would be an understatement. We look forward to things going smoothly we look forward to many happy occasions, but many times that is not what happens. People's expectations of the Messiah in Jesus' day were quite different from what is actually prophesied about him in the Old Testament, and therefore quite different from how he actually appeared in his first coming. That's why so many people were disappointed in Christ. And their expectations of the forerunner, the new Elijah, John the baptizer, were just as far off as their expectations of Jesus. John the baptizer was not only the last of the Old Testament prophets, he was and is the first of the New Testament prophets prophets. He is the one who introduces the Redeemer of the world to God's people and indeed to the whole world. Like John, you and I are all prophets. We are proclaimers of the gospel with our words and especially with our lives the way we behave and act in our world today, makes us prophets, even though we are not dressed in camel's hair and eat locusts and wild honey. My dear Christian friends, we too, like John, are prophets. But like John, we are more than prophets, even more so than he himself was. Now, many were coming to see John from all over the country. The Bible says things like, all of Judea, hundreds of thousands of people populated Judea at that time. All of Judea was coming to see John. Now, of course, that's a little bit of uh, approval uh, hyper, hyperbole, but it's, it's fine, it's okay. We know what he meant by that. We know God means that 
just about anybody that was anybody and everybody who had the ability were able to leave their jobs or homes or whatever for a minute or two or for a day, let's say, uh, were able to go to the River Jordan uh, in those area around there. Uh, if they had the ability, they went. Uh, and I'm sure that even though it doesn't mention Galilee, I'm sure many came from Galilee, many came from Perea, uh, many came from other parts of Palestine as well. And a lot of them, we are told, came in great repentance, and they came to be baptized into that baptism of repentance that God ordered John to do. But also many, perhaps the majority, came to ridicule John. They came to make fun of him. They came and they were repulsed by his appearance and they were repulsed especially by his message because his message was repent. Repent of your way of life. He told the soldiers, stop taking bribes. He told the Pharisees, stop legalizing uh, uh, on people. Stop, stop uh, trying to uh, teach salvation by works. He had a message of repentance and change for anybody and everybody that came to see him. Now, a lot of people today, they don't mind when we talk about Jesus and uh, they think in their minds, oh, that's the nice guy. Uh, Jesus is the sweetheart fella. Jesus is the one who says, love your neighbor. Jesus is the one who says, turn the other cheek. Jesus is the one who says, uh, uh, give peace and love to everybody uh, and all of that. They don't mind that too much at all. You can talk about that Jesus all day long and you won't get a whole lot of blowback. But that wasn't Jesus' only message. His message was a lot in the beginning like John's. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, turn around, change. People are not very fond of a message like that. People not, are very fond uh, to recognize sin in their lives, to be sorry of it, to admit that to God, to ask God's forgiveness, and especially, this is a hard part, to change, to change their habits, to change the way they're doing things. Pastors and I talk very often about the dearth of bodies on Sunday mornings in our churches. And while I don't agree with a lot of their uh, ideas, uh, I do uh, agree with this, and I do think this, and they tend to agree with me, that a lot of it has to do with habit. A lot of it has to do with repentance. Getting in the habit of coming before God in repentance. Getting in the habit of coming to hear God's word. And also, it has a lot to do with getting out of the habit of doing those things. And we agree that once you get out of the habit of doing those things, it is very, very easy to keep going in that direction rather than turn around and go back the other. And the same is true of all kinds of our actions in life. That's why John's message was so repudiated. People don't like to change. Or if they do change, they don't like to change People like to do, frankly, what they like to do. And don't do what they don't like to do. There's something they don't like, if something that they find unpleasant, or something they disagree with, they will change that direction and avoid doing those things. That was the problem with John's message. And that was the problem with John. And that's why so many people rejected John, just as they then soon rejected Jesus. And so Jesus turns the tables on them and says, what were you expecting about John? Hmm? He knew what they were expecting of him. But now he asks them a question, what were they expecting to see? Did it ever strike you a little odd 
that Jesus asked that particular question? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Now, wh why? Why do I say that? Well, what is it about prophets? What's the, what's, the most, what's the most important thing about a prophet? Is the most important thing about a prophet what he looks like? Or is the most important thing about a prophet what he says? You see, what did Isaiah look like? What did Elijah look like? We don't know. What did Jeremiah look like? The Bible doesn't say Why? Because it was their words that was important, not what they looked like or what they wore or what they ate. The Bible gives us a description of John. Why? And why does Jesus say to him, what did you go out to see? Because Jesus knew that most of the people went to see John for just that, to see John. They wanted to witness a spectacle. They were hoping to see a wild man. They were hoping to see a crazy man. They were hoping to see some lunatic. They were hoping to witness a show. They wanted John to put on a show. They were hoping maybe to see John arrested. Maybe they were hoping to see a battle between John's followers and uh, the Roman soldiers or, or the uh, temple guards. They wanted to be entertained. And again, isn't that a huge problem today in our churches? Where people want to be entertained. Not only do they not want to hear the, gospel, the law, they don't want to hear about sin, they don't want to hear about repentance, they don't want me or any one other preacher to tell them, hey, you need to change your lives. You need to stop thinking in a particular way and think that way. You need to stop talking a particular way and talk that way. You need to stop acting a particular way and act that way. They not only don't like that, they don't like to be bored. Do they? No. They want to be entertained. They want to be mesmerized by the show. And pyrotechnics. Well, maybe a good guitarist, too, huh? Or a keyboardist. Hmm? Ah. That's the problem, isn't it? And so Jesus takes this odd question here. And he goes to their true intentions. Now, what were they really expecting? What, did, what does he mean by that? And, and notice something else he says here. And I, I want you to pay a special attention to this. Did you go out to see a reed shaken in a wind. You know why that's special? I'm going to tell you why it's special. You may not know this. I had to do some digging to find this out. But do you know in the coins that Herod the Great and his sons too minted for Israel, on one side was a palm tree, which is always in history a representation of the tribe of Judah and the land of Judah and Israel. On the other side was Herod's visage, face, and, wait for it, wait for it, a reed. Yeah, a reed. The kind that grows by the River Jordan. Reed. That was one of Herod's great symbols. A reed. Why? Because Herod was the Romans' friend when the Romans were doing well. Herod was the Egyptians' friend when the Egyptians were doing well. Herod was the Christians' friend when the Christians were okay. Herod was the Jews' friend when the Jews were okay. Herod went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth his whole life. Both his father and his sons were exactly that way. And so that's why Jesus says, did you go out to see another reed shaken in the wind? Another guy who's forever doing this? Well, let's see, what does society want now? What do they want me to preach on now? Hmm? That's why Jesus asked that question, folks. Is that what we're looking for? Is that what we want? Do we want to be fed? Do we want to be fed just that which tickles our ears? Just that which tickles our fancies? Just that which makes us feel oh so warm and fuzzy and also good? 
Or are we willing to hear God's word in all its truth and purity? What did Jesus say when he sent the apostles out? He said, teach them to obey everything that I have taught. Make disciples of them. Make listeners of them, of everything. People were offended by John because he told them the truth about themselves that they did not want to hear. But they had to hear that. If they're going to have saving faith, if they're going to repent and come to faith, if the Holy Spirit's going to be able to work in them, they have to be able to see that they need a Savior. They have to be able to see that they need Jesus Christ. They have to be able to see they cannot pay for their own sins. They need the Son of God to die on a cross to pay for them. And that's what we need to see, my friends. And we don't need to see that just, oh, once a week. We don't need to hear that just once or twice, three times, four times a year, once a month. We need to hear that every week. And indeed, we need to hear that every day. I encourage you, seek out the gospel every day in your life. Seek out the gospel in your scriptures, in your catechism, in your Lutheran confessions, wherever. Seek out the gospel every single day. The law and the gospel, but especially the gospel every day, because you need to hear that. Calling sin, not sin, which is very popular in our society today, is really calling God and his son a liar. That's really what it is. When somebody says, oh, that's not a sin anymore, whatever it happens to be, whether it's we're talking about abortion, whether we're talking about divorce, whether we're talking about same-sex marriage, whether whatever we're talking about, if all of a sudden people say, well, that's no longer a sin, that is calling God a liar. And that is the same thing, folks, as unbelief. You may not want to hear that. There's a lot of people out there in the world that don't want to hear that. But that's the fact, Jack. You're calling God a liar. You're saying, God, you don't mean your word. Or you've changed your word. You've changed your mind. You don't believe that anymore. And that is just like saying, you are not the God you once were. Therefore, you are not the true God. <laughs> you are not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are not the Father of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So how was John more than a prophet? I'll tell you how. He not only proclaimed God's word, he fulfilled God's word. Isaiah didn't fulfill God's word. Isaiah proclaimed, hey, you're going to be taken off into captivity, you're going to come back in 70 years. He wasn't even alive when they were taken off in captivity. None of the other prophets, most of the other prophets, I should say, were not around, did not fulfill their own prophecy. John fulfilled his own prophecy. In other words, too, in this he was great. New Testament believers are even greater than John. Why? I'll tell you why. Because we have more of the prophecy than John had. John did not have the four Gospels. We do. John did not have the epistles of Paul. We do. John did not have the writings of Peter and James and John. We do. Paul did not have the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John. We do. We have the full and complete revelation of God's will, Old and New Testament. We have the gospel in the gospel writers, all four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we have then the apostles explaining that gospel and making it even more detailed and better for us in the epistles. And finally, we have also seen 2,000 years plus of God's grace and mercy to his believers. We have seen the church take terrible beatings. We have seen the church in terrible persecutions and almost driven to extinction. And we have seen the church on great highs. We have seen where everybody who was anybody was a member of the church. We have seen pews packed where people are having to set up chairs. We have seen buildings where you have to open the windows so people can hear outside that are standing room only. We have seen that in our lifetimes. The great highs. And just as we now are seeing the great lows. And I think, and I think you know this, 
I think it's going to get a lot lower before it turns around and goes the other way. Therefore, my dear Christian friends, we are indeed more than prophets like John. We can talk about the, the prophecies of Christ in the Old Testament and we can point to their fulfillment in the New Testament. We can preach John's law and we can also preach Christ's gospel. We can preach confidently of Christ's first coming. We can point to that as a historical fact and we can also point to his second coming as something that is absolutely positively going to happen. We can be just like John the baptizer. We can be a forerunner of Christ's second coming, which is even better. So I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we'll admit that not all our memories of Christmas past are good ones. I'm sure there are more than a few clunkers of memories in there. I know in my case, there were Christmases where my kids got sick the night before, or day before, or even day of. I know there were times when adults argued. My aunts and uncles and cousins and nephews and sometimes my children uh, and others. There were meals that were ruined, burned to a crisp or undone. There were guests who showed up very late or didn't show up at all. And we usually try to forget those images. We usually try to put those aside. And we usually try not to remember those this time of year. But you know what? Like Scrooge's ghost, they just keep coming back. And so they torment us. My dear Christian friends, what kind of memories, what kind of remembrances does God expect us to give of Christ and his prophet John? How does he expect us to prophesy to the world? What is God looking for from us? God wants us to be like a John. Not somebody blowing in the wind, hmm? whatever way society wants to go, but proclaiming simple law and gospel, sin and grace. Repentance and forgiveness. Let us each endeavor during this Advent and Christmas season to be good prophets. Good prophets like John. Good prophets like John who, yes, confront people with sin, but at the same time give them the comfort and peace of forgiveness in the Christ child, Jesus of Bethlehem. Because, my dear Christian friends, we are all more than prophets. Amen. And now the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in true faith through Christ Jesus, your Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for prayer. Omnipotent God, who is worthy to be held in awe by all people, we give you most humble and hearty thanks for the many blessings, which without any merit or worthiness on our part you have bestowed upon us. We praise you especially that you have preserved your saving word and the holy sacraments in truth and purity. Continue to protect and extend your kingdom throughout the world. Give your church faithful pastors and grant success to their preaching. Open the door of faith to unbelievers everywhere, including all the children of Abraham. In mercy, remember the enemies of your church and grant unto them repentance to eternal life. 
Be the protector and defender of your people in all times of tribulation and danger. Cause all those in your church to fight the good fight of faith. And in the end, receive the salvation of their souls. Below, bestow your grace upon all the nations of the earth. Bless our land and its all in its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause your word to be proclaimed openly throughout our country so that truth and righteousness would grow among us. Defend us from all calamities by fire, water, plague, war, and famine. Prosper everyone in their calling and cause all useful arts to flourish. Be the protector of the widow and the orphan, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the distressed. As we are but pilgrims on this earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work you have given us before the end comes when we can work no longer. And when our last hour comes, receive us into your everlasting kingdom, only through the merits of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We continue the middle of page 13. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the Messiah, the very Lamb of God, and calling sinners to repentance, that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. And therefore, again, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, laud and magnify thy glorious name, Evermore praising thee and singing. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.
We have the clear text in the very words of Christ, do this in remembrance of me. These are binding and commanding words by which all who would be Christians are enjoined to partake of this sacrament. Therefore, whoever would be a disciple of Christ with whom he here speaks must also consider and observe this. but in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and to please him. The congregation may now come forward for the Lord's Supper. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given up unto death, even the death of the cross for the forgiveness of of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Lord, sacrificed for you on the cross for the remission of your sins. This is the blood of your Savior, shed for your sins. Eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Lord, sacrificed for you on the cross, for the remission of your sins. This is the blood of your Savior, shed for you. <clears throat> Take and eat. This is the true body of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Savior Jesus Christ, sacrificed for you on the cross for the remission of all of your sins. This is the blood of your Savior, shed for you for your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up for you, for the remission of your sins. This is the blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Lord, given for the forgiveness of your sins. This is his blood shed for you on the cross for the remission of all of your sins.
Now may this be true, body and blood, of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Depart in God's peace. Amen. Please join now in the Nunc Dimittis. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that in your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Please join now in the closing hymn.
Please be seated. Very good morning to everyone once again. Good to have you here. Uh, today is uh, the social day over in the uh, Fellowship Hall, so it's our uh, December or annual social. Uh, I think a white elephant deal is in there, and I don't know what else. Also, there's food and drink, so take advantage of that. This week we do have a uh, Bible class on uh, Tuesday. I have a question though. Uh, I see quite a few people, uh, but, well, a few people anyway, usually here on Saturdays. Uh, Saturday is, of course, the 23rd, the day before Christmas Eve. So, um, is there any objection to having Bible basics that day? There's no catechism that day. Any objection? Any objection for anybody? All right, so we'll have basics next Saturday, 1 o'clock. Okay? Thank you very much and good morning. <laughs> 